We're traveling over the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The original collapsed in 1940, only six months after its completion. Michael Sullivan will share that story with us. The area we're standing in right now is uh, in the southern section of Puget Sound, which is the sort of Washington State and the Pacific Northwest's kind of great inland water. And when the Transcontinental Railroad came, there was talk about one day being able to span Puget Sound. But uh, it really wasn't an undertaking anybody was prepared to do. During the Depression, uh, federal programs like the building of the Grand Coulee Dam and stuff, the, there were big job creating public works projects happening in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, in the in the mid-1930s, there began to be talk about uh, creating a bridge over Puget Sound to reach from Tacoma to the Kitsap Peninsula. Tacoma Narrows Bridge was opened on the 1st of July uh, in 1940, uh, after two years of construction. I am afraid of bridges, sometimes I have to turn around. When I'm driving towards one, my heart begins to pound. Last night at the bridge to Johnsburg, I swerved down a dead end street. I sat there shaking in an empty lot full of broken glass and weeds. Then passed me in the Tacoma Narrows is also a bit of a wind tunnel and people working on the deck began to notice movement uh, and almost like airplane wing lift in the bridge. So unlike just kind of horizontal movement, they began to feel a vertical lift in the bridge, especially in the center span. Um, you know, uh, there was no suspension bridge anything like this anywhere in our part of the world, anywhere in the Pacific Northwest. So there was an unfamiliarity with just how a big thing like this was supposed to behave. So people excited about it. Uh, there is a certain musical kind of gracefulness about a bridge like this. So people, I guess, just wanted to think it wasn't anything wrong, that it was normal. And once they'd get all the concrete down on the deck and everything, the additional weight was added, that that would all go away. And then as we went out of summer and began to get into fall and the winds picked up a little bit, uh, our prevailing wind out of the southwest, which blows almost directly on to uh, across the bridge deck, uh, they began to notice that the that there was an undulation in the deck. And uh, by fall, soldiers were coming out from the military base for the novelty of riding the bridge. So they'd go out and they'd kick their feet over the railing and stand on the outside of the bridge and lean out as far as they could. And the center deck of the bridge would be rising not just inches, but feet, uh, to a point where the undulation was so severe that two automobiles or a truck and an automobile coming in opposite directions, the headlights of the vehicle coming at you would disappear under the rolling kind of hill of this, of the deck. So uh, for conservative people, something was horribly wrong from the very beginning. For a community that was proud of their new bridge, for the many people that participated in building the bridge, it was unthinkable that this was wrong. But the engineers began to work on the idea of some stiffening of the bridge. They thought that the, uh, 
the railings on the side could be converted into sort of deep I-beams and that that would uh, add some rigidity to the bridge. And so some of those minor um, structural additions, modifications were implemented or were about to be implemented as we got through October of 1940. And uh, by early November of 1940, really only four months, four and a half months after the bridge had been completed, the weather began to shift into its winter patterns. And, uh, and that really was the bellwether of what was about to happen. On the morning, though, of November 7th, the winds kicked up to about 40 miles an hour, and they were fiercely directed right at the side of the bridge, as if it, the way wind comes over a, the wing on an airplane. And instead of the normal undulation uh, of the bridge, the deck began to twist, began to turn, uh, and everybody noticed immediately that had been watching the bridge that that was a behavior people had not noticed before. And so early in the morning of the 7th, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people that had come out on both sides of the bridge to be able to, to start to watch what was happening, to start to watch this behavior. The, the bridge keepers, it was a toll bridge, so the bridge keepers had, uh, had decided that they would close the bridge. This just was wrong. It just was not safe anymore. And indeed, it was, uh, it was uh, just not a, not a action that should happen with an inanimate object of this size. Uh, one last car was coming across the bridge, even though the access to the bridge had been shut off. There was one last car coming across the bridge. A uh, man with his, coming from his summer home over on Kitsap Peninsula, headed towards Tacoma, had a cocker spaniel with him in the car, and by the time he got to the most severely moving part of the bridge deck, he couldn't control the automobile. So the car swung, just screeched around, and sort of ended up kind of diagonally across both lanes on the bridge. And he jumped out and ran and got off the bridge. And then for the next 30 or 40 minutes, the bridge went into just a violent, uh, just uh, movement that no one had seen before. And all of the crowds on both sides all sort of, you know, closed in to just watch. So there was, I, I think everyone started to suspect that the impossible was about to happen, that the bridge was going was gonna to give it up, was going to fail. I loved a girl named Joan Her skin smelled just like falling snow One day she drove us off the road Into a dead field of corn She left and hit the gas As we bounced along the road But I held on to the dash
on the bridge, strangely enough, a uh, university professor who had worked on trying to solve the puzzle. It was enough time for people to be able to get out there, and here's a University of Washington professor, Farquharson, actually ran out onto the bridge trying to get the dog out of the car. Uh, and there are, there's great footage of him. It looks like a Steven Spielberg movie. Today, you watch that footage, and you cannot even imagine that somebody would, would run out onto the bridge and, you know, with this tearing sort of uh, deck. Uh, he got out there, the dog was just too terrified to get out of the car, so he gave up and then kind of strolled back, was knocked down a couple times by the movement of the bridge, finally got off the bridge, and then in the few moments that followed, uh, the uh, deck tore away from the hangars, and they'd be, witnesses talk about it being like listening to gunshots because the, the jewels they're called, these big... Uh, bolts that are, the cable comes down, goes through the deck, and then there's a big bolt on the bottom to keep it from pulling out. Those uh, jewels begin to pop, and uh, the cables begin to snap under the force. The light standards on the bridge are just cutting, swirling across rapidly, and uh, catching on the cables, and uh, in just a moment, uh, the connection between two sections of the bridge deck uh, fail and there's a violent uh, twist and tear of the deck and in the moments that followed that huge sections all begin to fail and most of the center span of the bridge underneath the big suspension cables falls away, drops away from the bridge and then just plunge into Puget Sound. No one is killed in the incident. Uh, no one's even hurt. So they demolish as much as they can, this in November of 1940, and then uh, as they begin to think about really having to re-engineer the whole thing, uh, uh, the clouds of war close in, of the, se the Second World War, and uh, by that time they realize there's no way during the war effort that they're going to be able to get the bridge rebuilt, and then Pearl Harbor happens the Bremerton shipyards become a critical strategic thing and uh, the, the focus shifts away from public works projects and uh, in fact the towers and the steel on the bridge is actually removed and um, brought into the war effort, recycled and turned into bullets and tanks and whatever. Um, actually sections of the bridge of the steel are actually used on the Alaska Highway to build a highway up to Alaska during the Second World War because of the Lend-Lease program and the, the ties with the Northwest and Alaska. So, um, so it really, the, the, uh, the remnants of Galloping Gertie sit in the channel uh, through the war and then uh, it's only after the war that they begin to reconstruct uh, another suspension bridge. And then in 1950, the second uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge is complete. And that's the bridge we see in the distance here, um, the steel bridge that's standing, the steel towers in the distance. I doubt that there's a textbook or a reference book written about bridge engineering that doesn't include Tacoma in the index because of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And uh, it's impossible for me to imagine that uh, engineering students all over the world have seen the film of, uh, of Galloping Gertie's Collapse. It is one of those absolutely spellbinding moments in engineering history, one of those disasters, those utter failures of design that is completely captured on film. And it is amazing. It still is jaw-dropping to see a huge uh, endeavor like this, a physical object move with this much, just dance almost with this much uh, movement um, that are out of the parameters of the original design.